Hi, I'm Callan Bentley from Northern Virginia Community College, and I wanted to welcome you to another one of these little videos that takes a look at some of the geological history of the Commonwealth of Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic region. Today I'd like to talk about the Allegheny and Orogeny, a mountain building event that occurred in the late Paleozoic, closing the Iapetus Ocean and helping to put together the supercontinent Pangaea. Take a look at this geologic map here, or this uh, paleogeographic map here. This is one of the lovely images that's been produced by Ron Blakey of Northern Arizona University. It shows a situation at about 360 million years ago during the height of what we call the Acadian orogeny. During the Acadian orogeny, we had the collision between North America and a microcontinent called Avalonia. And as those two land masses collided, uh, a series of mountains were raised along the East Coast. Those mountains shed off copious quantities of sediment and those sediments were deposited in um, this shallow inland sea, the Kaskaskia Sea, um, at that time. What you can see here in this image, though, is that that collision is just a prelude to a much larger collision that's on its way. Ancestral Africa is moving towards North America um, and closing the Iapetus Ocean. The collision ends up taking place over the late Paleozoic, over a time span of around 50 million years or so. Here's a series of uh, snapshots, again, from this paleogeographic series by Ron Blakey. Um, this is the situation by around 300 million years ago. You can see the Appalachian Mountains are young and fresh and high and rugged. So they run through um, the middle of this new supercontinent. And they mark the suture zone between ancestral Africa and ancestral North America. This completes the assembly of Pangaea. And the moment Pangaea is born is essentially the moment the Iapetus Ocean has died. Over time, the Appalachian Mountains were weathered and eroded. You can see uh, this situation here uh, around 250 million years ago shows markedly less topographic relief along the suture zone. Um, where has all that mountain mass gone? Well, it's largely been turned into sediment. Some of that sediment has been drained away from the Appalachian Mountain Highlands. Um, and dumped in adjacent low-lying areas. And we have evidence of Mississippi-sized rivers draining the Appalachians and carrying sediment as far as Arizona. The Petrified Forest, a famous location in Arizona, is actually buried underneath Appalachian sediment. Zircon crystals in the sands and muds uh, that buried the Appalachian, or the uh, Petrified Forest, um, those zircon crystals carry Appalachian signatures. The Appalachian Mountains in our area are actually expressed in three different physiographic provinces, the Valley and Ridge, the Blue Ridge, and the Piedmont province. Um, though the Piedmont is not particularly mountainous today, it's characterized more by rolling hills, um, that is actually part of the Appalachian Mountain Belt. And even though you have to go west out of the Piedmont to get to what is today mountains, that wasn't the case necessarily when the Appalachians were at their youngest. It's also worth noting that uh, the Ouachita Mountains in Arkansas and Oklahoma and the Marathon Mountains in Texas are part of the Valley and Ridge Province um, that are just not connected up to the rest of the Valley and Ridge Province because the uh, connecting pieces are buried underneath um, uh, younger sedimentary deposits that obscure the actual continuity of the mountain belt. But this is a very long mountain belt, a very long collisional zone. This image comes to us from Bob Lilly's uh, excellent book, Parks and Plates. Here's a uh, cartoon cross-section through an average mountain belt. This could be an ancient mountain belt. It could be a modern mountain belt. The characteristics are roughly the same. You'll notice that you've got uh, areas of intense metamorphism, including partial melting. That partial melting can generate granitic magma, and that granitic magma can intrude into the crust. You may also find uh, little slices of oceanic crust, um, little scraps of the ocean basin that used to separate the continents. Those are uh, today called ophiolites. And then you've got a variety of deformation. Um, so you've got folding, you've got faulting. Um, in some areas, the folding and faulting occurs independent of the uh, crystalline basement rocks, uh, so so-called thin-skinned uh, folding and thrusting. In other places, the basement rock does participate, and you get little chunks of the basement rock that break off and, and go slicing up through the softer overlying sedimentary layers. So when the Appalachian Mountains were young, the highest peaks actually would have been above those rocks that today experience the highest temperatures and pressures. And we know they experience high temperatures and pressures because they are metamorphosed. So the rocks that equilibrated, that reacted and changed and, and uh, grew a new suite of minerals that were happy at high temperatures and pressures 
were the rocks that were underneath the deepest um, you know, pile of uh, mountain. Um, so when the Appalachians were young, the highest peaks actually would have been over the Piedmont province um, because it's the rocks of the Piedmont province that were most metamorphosed during that event. So if you look around uh, the Piedmont today at places like Washington, D.C., or the place where I'm recording this video, Annandale, Virginia, you know, and then imagine you know, that 250 million years ago there would have been mountain peaks here as high as the Himalayas. It's quite a different perspective than most people usually have. So obviously it doesn't look like that anymore, and the reason for that is that the Appalachian Mountains have been worn down through weathering and erosion. So when they're young and fresh like the Alps or the Himalayas, you have tall peaks, but over time, erosion, weathering, mass wasting, tear down those peaks, and you're left with just the roots of those mountain ranges. So today, um, the Appalachians have sort of attained a middle age status, and probably they'll continue to erode in the future to a more flat-lying uh, topography, uh, like you see in the many mountain belts that crisscross the Canadian Shield. However, you can tell that mountains used to be here because they still bear all those characteristic geologic signatures. So we've got things like the folding, the faulting, the metamorphism. Um, we've got uh, those uh, broken off chunks of basement rock like the Blue Ridge, and we've got the thin skin thrust faulting like we find out in the Valley and Ridge province. The Blue Ridge itself is anticlinal in structure. That means that it is a, a fold and that fold overall is arched up in the middle as opposed to being arched down in the middle. Um, on each side of that fold you can find a, a characteristic suite of rocks which includes the basement complex, the original uh, granites and granite gneisses that were produced during the Grenville orogeny around a billion years ago and then deposit on top of them some sedimentary and volcanic rocks that um, record the rifting of Rodinia and then subsequent sea level rise. So um, what you're looking at here is sort of a cartoon cross section through the Blue Ridge province with the Piedmont on the east, the Valley and Ridge on the west. And notice that the Blue Ridge province basically has climbed up on top of Valley and Ridge rocks along a big thrust fault. That thrust fault can be visualized with an analogy like this cake. Here we've got an older cake being shoved on top of a younger cake, gliding along a weak layer, a layer of icing. With the real Blue Ridge, of course, it's not icing, but it is a geological equivalent of a banana peel, and that's the Waynesboro Formation that accommodates a lot of the slip along that Blue Ridge Thrust Fault. Looking quickly here at the uh, topography, you can see where the Blue Ridge meets the Valley and Ridge here. Um, you're looking at Shenandoah National Park on the east, the Bull Run Mountains off in the distance. That's the other side of that Blue Ridge anticline fold. Um, and in the foreground, the Page Valley, on the left or the west, Massanut Mountain, including the Fort Valley, and then the, the main Shenandoah Valley over on the far west. Um, different urban centers like Front Royal and Strasburg are off in the distance. Let's go ahead and conceptually slice open this picture along this line right here and remove the foreground so we can see what is happening down there in the earth. You can see the Blue Ridge Thrust Fault coming up there on the right, the trace of it running across the landscape, something like that. And the overall anticlinal structure of the Blue Ridge is seen here in uh, sort of half view. Um, you can also see that the uh, Massanutten uh, area is underlain by a very big downturn fold or a syncline. So essentially we call this the Blue Ridge Anticlinorium and the Massanutten Synclinorium. The Blue Ridge Thrust Fault is marked by uh, Breccia. Uh, this is highly fractured uh, Antietam formation. It's the site of lots of manganese mines, so all the little uh, symbols that you see right here uh, along the boundary between the Blue Ridge and the Valley and Ridge are manganese deposits. Um, it rotated the uh, unconformity that separates the Catoctin Formation from the basement complex. And we end up seeing basically over time, um, you know, first the Grenville Mountains, then the eruption of the Catoctin Formation, then the uh, burial of the Catoctin Formation underneath the sediments of the Chilhowee Group, which piled up during a transgression in Cambrian time, topped off with carbonate sediments, and then everything was deformed during Allegheny and mountain building. Finally today we end up seeing the landscape that we have today. You can see here very readily the difference between the Blue Ridge and the Valley and Ridge provinces in terms of the way that they weather out. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great day.